Okay, our next speaker is Constance Holland. She's a Colorado native, raised on a farm in San Luis Valley. She has been an emergency planner consultant in Northern California, an accounting clerk in uh, Pro Produce Warehouse, an administrative and research assistant for a couple of environmental, environmental nonprofits, a census taker, a college professor in environmental policy, sociology and history, and is currently a professional storyteller. And she also won the award for person who is best able to apply for jobs. No. <laughs> In addition to her storytelling, <laughs> wow. I never usually am like that when they're that close. <laughs> In addition to her storytelling, she has begun to portray the historical character of Mary Hunter Austin. Tonight she will take you through how Mary Austin became a highly acclaimed naturalist writer and one of the first women to address the water needs, which a footnote, if I correct me if I'm wrong, she was one of the ones that tried to deny LA all the water it gets from us. But anyway, that's another story. Maybe I should do this. No. <laughs> water needs of the American West in her presentation. Becoming Mary Austin, that is her presentation. Mary Hunter Austin was born in 1868 in Carlinville, Illinois. As a young girl, she lost her father in Champion at age nine and spent the rest of her life trying to earn her mother's approval. The mother who worried about a daughter's oddness and chastised her for having to be different. In 1888, the family moved to Rancho Tejon, or near it, a 200,000 acre ranch in northern California. There, Mary Austin spent her life outdoors, breaking trail up new slopes in heat, cloudbursts, snow, and all, and following the mountain bloom. She was encouraged in this by General Fitzgerald Beale, who took an interest in the 20-year-old Mary Austin and encouraged her explorations. He deserved by his his friends called him a scholar, gentleman, and Indian fighter. Now Mary Austin's mother worried very much about her daughter's interests and her, her companions. One day she cried out, I have brought you out here to a place where you'll find no one like your own sort to marry. However, she was confused because Wallace Austin did step up and ask her to marry him. Mary Austin um, moved with her husband to the Great Owens Valley in 1892. And there, they, she began to spend her life and start the writing career she intended. However, in the Owens Valley, she found that she was as odd there to her neighbors as she had been to her mother. And so spent her life with the out, being an outsider, wandering up to the Campotes of the Paiute Indians and into the backyards of Spanish cooks. In 1892, she had her only daughter, Ruth. Unfortunately, Ruth was born mentally handicapped and would never learn to read or write or be independent. Mary's struggles as a mother were much criticized by her neighbors. The Aust the, Wallace, the Austins had begun to see their marriage fall apart about this time, as Wallace was never a good provider, and Mary could not convince him to take an interest in such. But in 1902, Los Angeles began to go after the Owens River, and the Wallaces came back together to fight for the survival of the river, urging President Theodore Roosevelt to take the Owens Valley side. Their nemesis in this was William Mulholland, the head of the Los Angeles Water and Power. Mary Austin wrote the book, The Ford, talking about Mr. Mulholland. Now, during the time of their marriage, she was frequently apart from her husband, and one time she spent a good share of the year in Los Angeles with Charles Loomis, who was the editor of the LA Times and of a magazine called Out West. He encouraged her interest in Indians and the natural world. Her first book, The Land of Little Rain, 
came out in 1903. It was illustrated by E. Boyd Smith, and one critic said, none of these pictures bring out the country with its human and animal dwellers, as does a single paragraph of Austin's prose. The book has never been out of publication. With the, with the Owens River lost and Mary's marriage nearly over, she left the Owens Valley for the, um, for the seaside resort of Carmel, California, where she hung out with writers like Jack London, Ambrose Bierce, and George Sterling. However, this gay time could not last, and she found that she was very ill. Doctors thought she was suffering from breast cancer, and so she went off to Europe to see it before she died, where there she became friends with many expatriates, including Herbert and Lou Hoover. While there, she also met the women's movement um, suffragette, Anne Martin, who encouraged her to return to the US and get involved in the American <laughs> women's movement. <laughs> she did so and was often a great lecturer. Well, in the US, she went to New York and tried to live with amongst the literati of the day, but she soon found that she could not understand the rhythms of New York. What she did understand were the salons of Maybelle Dodge, who would become her lifelong friend. She left New York and returned back to Carmel, where she met Charles McDougall, who would become her last great love. With Mr. McDougall, she explored the West, including the Colorado River watershed, and eventually settled in <laughs> and eventually settled in Santa Fe, where she became active in Native American arts and, set, and preserving the old, the old Spanish mission arts, as well as the mission church. While in Santa Fe in 1927, she was selected by a New Mexico governor to be a delegate to the Seven States Conference on the Colorado River, <laughs> where she took a stand against the development of the river. And when her views were not respected, she walked out. Mary Austin probably is best thought of between the writers of John Muir and Edward Abbey. She saw Muir as loving the natural world but ignoring the humans that were a part of it. Ed Abbey would have been closer in line with her thoughts as he was very much interested in the working man. Mary Austin died in 1934 and her ashes are entombed on Mount Picacho outside Santa Fe. In a last letter she said, no doubt the great literary genius of life and landscape will come after me when the sense of man as inextricably part of this background has been accepted. You will say Mary Austin was the first to whom, to whom, have, to whom this was presented. dresser is Carol Hepke. <laughs> Costuming by. <laughs> Thank you. That was fun. That was good. Very informative. That, you know, that is one of the great things about Pachacacha is historically and all the different information that is spoken about here and that people talk about are things that we may just sort of every now and then we have a genius attack and it pops up in there if you're like me you get an air bubble in the brain chamber and it vanishes quickly <laughs> but what is amazing is the amount of information knowledge ingenuity and know-how that is in the city limits of Longmont so and I mean it's great because we get we've had drummers, we've had guitarists, we've had singers, we've had professors, we've had all kinds of presentations, and it's the kind of thing where if you have any hobbies or anything you feel you want to share, this is the perfect venue for it. I mean, it really is, and you can have fun while you're doing it. We will throw in the costuming. 